All right, well, hey, we started a series last week called The Day I Met God. How many of you guys were here last week for that? Uh, congratulations on surviving the whole message as uh, we talked through the story of Job. And um, I don't know if you guys have been a pastor before, but that was hard. There's 42 chapters of the book of Job we had got through last week. Had to condense that story down a little bit. And uh, it still ended up being 50 minutes. But it was good. The day I met God. And what we're doing in this series is we're, we're doing character studies throughout Scripture. And uh, we're looking at different people in the Bible. The moment, the day that they met God and what followed after. And so last week we looked at the character of Job. Uh, This week we're going to take on a new character. But um, the the question I have for you through this series is for you really to reflect on the day that you met God, the day that you met God and what followed after. Uh, Because we believe we serve a living God. And, And when we come into the presence of a living God, there is an experience, there is an encounter, and something in your life will change. And maybe you've encountered God before, maybe you've had that experience, maybe you haven't. And so the challenge for you uh, is to know that, that God's presence is waiting on you today for you to encounter him, for you to meet him. But we want to be a church, we want to be a people that, that doesn't just talk about God, but we have a knowing of a connection, of an intimacy with the God of creation. And uh, so that's what we're doing throughout this series. And, and the challenge, like I said, for us is to reflect on the day that you met God and what followed after. And um, I'm going to try to do this more throughout our series, um, different series that we preach. But uh, I want to make connection points for us as a people uh, that this isn't just some cute message you hear on a Sunday morning and then you forget about it when you walk out the door. Um, But man, I I think that something should change, something should shift in us as a result of what happens here this morning. And so what uh, we've done is we've created a couple uh, interactive opportunities for you to engage in this series. It's um, extra credit. So if you're an extra credit teacher's pet student, um, I love those people. And um, what I've been doing is encouraging everyone to get a copy of this book. And I think there's a slide for it. It's called The Bush Always Burns. And it's by Heath Adamson, and it's about Jesus in the unannounced moments of life. And what we're going to do is um, some of the the preaching notes, some of the things I'm talking about come out of this book. Um, Mainly, it was just an incredible inspiration for putting together this series. But I want to encourage you to get a copy of the book. If you go on our Path Church app and go to resources, you can actually click on the link for the book and just take you right to Amazon and get yourself a copy. Uh, But coming up on August 28th, someone say August 28th, at my house at 5 p.m., we're going to do just a study review. So if you get a copy of the book, you read it, want to come fellowship with us and talk about the book for a couple hours, we'd love to invite you into our living room, come have a conversation with us. And and the last thing is this, it's also in the app. Um, If you notice this week, we did a special interview. And what I'm doing each week is I'm, I'm interviewing an individual and asking them, diving into this conversation, the day you met God and what followed after. And so I had a special guest, Greg, with me this last week. And so if you missed it, you can, on the Path Church app, um, you can click on Beyond the Message, and it's uh, real stories from real people. And each week, we're going to be doing one of those. And I want to encourage you just to go check that out and listen to the interview. And uh, we'll do another one of those this week. And so it's just an opportunity for us to engage with this series, The Day I Met God. And um, I want to start with a quote. It actually comes out of the book this morning, and it says this. The Greek New Testament includes two primary words for know. One means knowledge based on fact. The other is knowledge based on experience. In our culture, we assume that if someone attends church, they know Jesus. But this isn't necessarily true. Knowing about Jesus and truly knowing him are two separate realities. When we know Jesus, we listen to him when he speaks to us, and we are sensitive enough to what he is doing to take part in it. Only when we live in communion and experience with him do we know him in the most profound way. When God speaks and we listen, incredible things happen. 
And, and that's the encouragement through this series. And like I said, you might be sitting here today and you might say, well, I've already experienced that. And, and maybe there's some of us watching online or we're here in person and we have never had that experience. The encouragement is to have that experience or if you haven't had that or if you have had that experience to reflect back on it, to remember the moment that you met God. And I want you to think about what happened the moment you met God and, and what happened after that. And, and today we're going to explore into the scriptures this morning. If you want to open to the book of Luke chapter 19, we find the, the story of a man named Zacchaeus. And, and today I, I want to read you this story. And it says this, Jesus entered Jericho and made his way through the town. There was a man named Zacchaeus. He was the chief tax collector in the region, and he had become very rich. He tried to get a look at Jesus, but he was too short to see over the crowd. So he ran ahead, and he climbed a sycamore fig tree beside the road, for Jesus was going to pass that way. When Jesus came by, he looked up at Zacchaeus, and he called him by name. Zacchaeus, he said, quick, come down. I must be a guest in your home today. Zacchaeus quickly climbed down and he looked to Jesus, took him to his home in great excitement and joy. But the people were displeased. He has gone to be the guest of a notorious sinner, they grumbled. Meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and said, I will give half of my wealth to the poor. Lord, if I have cheated anyone on their taxes, I will give them back four times as much. Jesus responded, salvation has come to this home today. For this man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and to save those who are lost. This is a, a really short story, uh, but it's a very powerful encounter that we see in the Gospels. And, and the Gospels being the recorded life of Jesus we read about in the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And what we need to understand from this encounter is this, is Zacchaeus, someone say Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus wanted to see Jesus, but he didn't want to be seen by Jesus. Zacchaeus wanted to see Jesus, but he didn't want to be seen by Jesus. And I, I'm going to unpack this a little bit today, but the, the main point I want us to understand this morning is, is that many of us, we want to see Jesus we have a desire to see Jesus. You know, the, the actual, this generation coming up right now, Generation Z, it's behind millennials. And I, I had the opportunity of being born right on the borderline. So I don't know what I am. I might be a millennial. I might be a, a Gen Z. Whichever one you're more partial towards, that's the one I'll choose to be. Uh, but um, right on the border. But this next generation, Gen Z, um, there, there's a, a phrase going around that they're, they're spiritual, but they're not religious. That this is one of the most spiritual generations coming up behind us, and it's why we, we've preached messages in the past that we need to be a church that moves in the power of the Holy Spirit, uh, a church that encounters the presence of the living God, because there's a generation hungry for spiritual things, uh, a generation that, that is not atheistic or agnostic in disbelief of a God. They believe in a spiritual power. They believe in a spiritual force. They believe there's something beyond the things that we come and they see and know. And, and they're hungry for it. And we as a church, we as a, a, a body of believers that know the truth of the word, know the answer. And, and so Jesus is walking by the town of Jericho and Zacchaeus, he wants to see Jesus, but he doesn't necessarily want to be seen by Jesus. And, and the point today for us is that many of us, we want to see Jesus but we, we don't necessarily want to be seen by Jesus. And uh, this story, it reminds me of a, a time in my life when I, I was in a buddy's wedding. And uh, my buddy Garrett, he's a really good friend. Um, if um, you see me playing any instruments up here, he's the reason why. Um, I didn't get along with my dad as my guitar teacher. And, um, and he had an intern uh, growing up. And uh, he loved to play music. And I started taking lessons from him. And uh, ultimately just inspired me to, to pick up all these different instruments. But a uh, great friend. And uh, I was honored to be a part of his wedding. And um, he got married. We're in the wedding. 
And uh, I don't know if you've been in a wedding before and, you know, the best part of the wedding is just standing in the hot sun for hours taking photos. And um, so after the wedding, we, we had the ceremony. We, we had a great time. He gets married. And then um, we went to the reception, which was about 10 minutes up the road on a golf course. And while everyone was getting their food, we were outside taking pictures. And, um, and so as we were taking pictures... Um, yeah, again, I don't know what weddings you've been to, but typically you, you walk in, groomsmen with the bridesmaid, and um, everyone seemed to partner up just fine, but for some reason, uh, the bridesmaid that I walked down the aisle with uh, did not show up for the, the photos. And um, the, the story is actually worse than that, but I won't go into it, um, the reason as to why she didn't show up, but we'll just forget about that for now. Uh, the, the point is, she didn't show up, and so we're taking pictures, and everyone has a partner except for me. And um, so I, I wanted to share, this photo's a little blurry, but I uh, just wanted you to check this out today. If you can find me in the photo, it's like a little book of Where's Waldo. Um, everyone has a partner except for me, so the, the consensus was, well, we'll just put Taylor up in this tree. <laughs> and um, so I know I look a little different. Some of you guys have been waiting for me to get a haircut. Um, that's what you get right there. So uh, I'm up there in the tree. And uh, this has got to go down as one of the most awkward wedding photos of all time. Uh, but what, what I want you to, to know about this story and about this tree is um, this is not what we read about in, in the book of Luke chapter 19. Um, because I, I think some of us, we have this idea, and the thing that leads us on is, is this part where it says Zacchaeus was short, right? He couldn't see over the crowd, so he, he climbed a tree. And um, I think as we interpret the story for ourselves, at least for myself, the way I used to interpret this story, um, is I, I thought about this photo. And I thought, what could be more obvious than this dude hanging out in a tree completely out of place, right? And, and we imagine Jesus is just walking by, and there's Zacchaeus, and he's, he's hanging out up in the tree, and he's like, hey, Jesus, and uh, Jesus sees him and calls him out from the tree. Uh, but that's not really the reason Zacchaeus climbed the tree. Uh, see, scripture tells us it was a sycamore tree. And so I brought a picture of a, a sycamore tree. And um, the interview uh, that I had this week with the individual I had, he actually lives uh, overseas. Um, be careful not to disclose his location because he's a, a global worker. But, um, but he said his children actually play in these trees. And he, he told me, I was telling him about my message this morning. And he said, you know, we went to a park the other day. And he said, you're spot on with everything you're talking about. He said, my kids were at the park playing in these trees. He said, sycamore trees are, are very low to the ground with their branches. So for a child even, it's very easy to climb up into one of these trees. But as you can see, the trees are full of, of foliage. A and these trees are, are trees that if you climb up into them, you can hide yourself and camouflage yourself away. A and Zacchaeus, it tells us that he, he climbed up into this tree. A and the reality is Zacchaeus is asking himself this question is, how close can I get to Jesus without being seen? And for those in faith that are searching for Jesus, oftentimes we're asking the same question. How close can I get to this thing? How close can I get to seeing Jesus without being seen by Jesus? And so the, the question is, why does Zacchaeus not want to be seen? And the question before that is, who is Zacchaeus? And we read about it in Luke 19, verse 2. It says, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was the chief tax collector in the region, and he had become very rich. Now, what I'm about to share with you is not probably new information to a lot of you if you've heard this story preached before. Um, but in general, uh, tax collectors were not people you wanted to befriend. Uh, they weren't buddies of the people. But tax collectors were one of the common people. And it's something to know that, that tax collectors, uh, if you know that the nation of Israel at the time was occupied by Rome. They were under uh, Roman oppression. Uh, but their communities, I don't know if you've seen a map of the Roman Empire, but it's, it spreads out far and wide. And, and so in different communities, they would employ individuals to do the work of the emperor. And tax collectors were of the common people. Um, but they were employed by the oppressing nation, Rome. A and so Zacchaeus is, is one of his own people, but he's employed by the Romans to collect taxes. A and many of you know this, but as long as Rome received their share, 
It, it didn't matter what they chose to collect. They could use their authority and their position to collect whatever they wanted to collect. And as long as Rome got their share, they could keep whatever extra was on top. And, and so not only was he as a tax collector an oppressor, but he was a traitor to his own people, to his own tribe. And, and so he's known for robbing his own people. Worse yet, it says he was very rich. So not only is uh, he a tax collector that robs people of their money, he's very good at it. He, he's very good at robbing people of their wealth. And, and he tried to get a look at Jesus, but it says he was too short to see over the crowd. So why is it that, that Zacchaeus doesn't want to be seen? How do we know that he doesn't want to be seen? Well, for one, if you read into the story a little bit, you'll know that he wasn't welcomed among the crowd. If you saw a tax collector in that day, this wasn't a man you wanted to associate with. This was a man you wanted to get away from. Zacchaeus would not have been welcomed in the circle of people that are surrounding Jesus. And, and so he moves beyond the crowd. And, and here's the deal. Most encounters we see in the gospel, we see Jesus, they involve people that have been victimized. We see Jesus' compassion towards those who are oppressed. But there's something unique happening in this story in, in that Zacchaeus is not being oppressed. Zacchaeus is the oppressor. Zacchaeus is no victim. Zacchaeus is the perpetrator. And, and this story shows us an encounter of Jesus' compassion towards the oppressor. And, and here's the deal is Zacchaeus knew who he was. Zacchaeus was not confused about his work as a tax collector. He was not confused of the, the general opinion that people had about him. Zacchaeus knew who he was, and he wanted to see Jesus. Zacchaeus knew who he was, and he wanted to see Jesus. Uh, and Zacchaeus, more importantly, he knew that he was lost. Uh, I don't know if you've ever been lost before, um, one of the scariest moments is as a two-year-old getting lost in the Home Depot and you, you go looking for dad and you tug on the stranger's ankle and you look up and it's, it's not the man you were looking for. I don't know if you've had that experience before, but I've been traumatized more than once in my life. <laughs> Zacchaeus, look, he, he knew that, that he was lost and, and he wanted to see Jesus. And um, I, I just need to give a fair warning. This is not from the Bible. Um, so I want to share a quote. Um, Captain Barbosa uh, from Pirates of the Caribbean, I just, I thought about this as I was putting this together. Uh, he shared a, a quote, but I think it's, it's um, it, well, and I should say he's a fictional character too, so this is not a real man, so don't go writing books about him or anything. But um, he says this in the, the film, uh, he says, For certain you have to be lost to find a place that can't be found. Elseways, everyone would know where it was. See, Zacchaeus knew that he was lost. And he wanted to see Jesus. And so it says this in Luke 19, 4. So he ran ahead and he climbed a sycamore fig tree beside the road. For Jesus was going to pass by that way. And um, I, I brought something. It's not quite a sycamore tree, but... It's going to have to work for today. So... I thought about getting a Christmas tree out of the, uh, the shed, but I didn't feel like putting that much effort in this morning. So um, what we have to understand culturally, and like I said, is really cool because I had this conversation midweek with someone that actually lives there, and he verified the information. And um, so sycamore trees are not things that you would find in town. The, the, the foliage of the tree is so big that the culture of that day was that the town was supposed to be a beautiful square. It was a beautiful place. When you looked out, you wanted to see the beauty of the town. So they didn't plant these trees in town because they wanted the view not to be obstructed. A and so sycamore trees were planted on the outskirts of town. And what the story tells us is that Jesus was passing through the town of Jericho. Jesus is on his way through this town, and, and so the, the crowd is following Jesus as Jesus makes his way to one end to the other end of town. And, and so it says that Zacchaeus ran ahead of the crowd. He, he goes far beyond where everyone is, and he climbs this tree. 
And what we know from the ancient culture is this tree would have been on the outskirts of the town where he knew Jesus and this crowd are making their way and following. It says that Jesus was going to pass by that way. The other thing that's interesting is it said that he ran ahead. And as I know Steve's preached this at least once before, so many of you probably know this. It's very shameful in Middle Eastern culture for a man to be seen running. It, it wasn't common for men to run. In fact, it was a, a shameful act. And what it tells us about Zacchaeus is Zacchaeus wanted to see Jesus. It, he didn't care about shaming himself in the process of positioning himself in a place where he could see Jesus. And, and so he, he climbs this, this tree far ahead of the crowd, uh, again, a tree that's very easy to hide behind. And, and he's up in the tree waiting because he knows Jesus is going to be passing by. And it continues, and it says this in Luke 19, verse 5, When Jesus came by, he looked up at Zacchaeus, and he called him by name. Zacchaeus, he said, quick, come down. I must be a guest in your home today. There's a really important piece of the passage because it says that he called him by name. It's a very intentional act by Jesus because who's surrounding Jesus? The crowd. And so by name, everyone would have known his name. Everyone would have known that he's this chief tax collector. Remember, Zacchaeus is not welcome among the crowd, which is why he's in the tree in the first place. And Jesus calls out his name. And now he's been given away. I don't know if you've ever been given away before. But the whole crowd, would, he's intentionally hiding in this tree, not to be seen. He's now been called out in front of all of those who despise him. And Jesus says, Zacchaeus, come down for I must be a guest in your home. Why was Zacchaeus hiding? Why did he not want to be seen by Jesus? Because here's the deal, he knew who he was. He knew that he was a sinner. He knew the people that he had robbed. He knew the, the, the ache of the sin in his life. Zacchaeus knew that he was lost. And so he didn't necessarily want to be seen by Jesus because that might expose him, but he did want to see Jesus. And it says this, um, well, actually, I'll say this first, is that Zacchaeus lived a, a very lonely life. If you chose the life of a tax collector, you chose to be rejected from the crowd, you chose the path of loneliness. Zacchaeus was not accepted among his own people. He was, uh, as much as he was an oppressor, he was also segregated from society. He was an outcast. He, he was cast out by his own people because he was a, a traitor to his own people. And so here he is hiding, and, and I can't help but think in this, this story, um, this is a familiar passage to Scripture. And, and if you look in Genesis chapter 3, 8 through 11, says this, when the cool evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking about in the garden. So they did what? They hid from the Lord among the trees. Then the Lord God called out to them, where are you? He replied, I heard you walking in the garden, so I hid because I was afraid and I was naked. Who told you you were naked, the Lord God asked. See, Zacchaeus, he's, he's hiding because Zacchaeus knows who he is. Zacchaeus knows the sin within. He knows the acts that he's committed. And, and Zacchaeus wants to see Jesus. Adam and Eve, they're, they're looking. They can see God from their vantage point, but they don't want to be seen by Jesus. Why? Because they're naked. See, sin does a, an interesting thing. Thing. Sin tells us that we're naked. Sin tells us that we're naked. Jesus says, of course you are. Of course you're naked. That's the way I made you. There, there's no shame in your nakedness. But, but Jesus, we're, we're naked. It, he says, come out from where you are. I know that you're naked. Who told you that you were naked? I don't see anything different than I've ever seen before, right? 
that this is the way that I made you. Sin says I'm naked, but Jesus says I already know. I already see you where you are. I already see you in your nakedness. And then he calls out to us and he says, where are you? To Zacchaeus, he says, come out of the tree. See, Jesus, he calls us out from our place of hiding. This is a very important theme to understand in the gospel. Jesus always, to those who are looking to see him, he will call you out from your place of hiding. And it says this as we continue the story in verses 6 through 7. Zacchaeus quickly climbed down and he took Jesus to his house in great excitement. Mm. But the people were displeased. For he had gone to be the guest of a notorious sinner, they grumbled. Now let's just play to the crowd for a moment. Jesus has got this great following of people. They're with Jesus because they want to see Jesus in action. And Jesus skips over everyone around him. He looks up to the place in which Zacchaeus is trying very intently not to be seen. And he calls him out. And these people know this man in the tree. They know why the man is hiding in the tree. Not only does Zacchaeus know the sin in his life, but everyone surrounding him understands who this man is. And you can hear the crowd, but Jesus, that's unacceptable. Jesus, that's not okay. Jesus, you can't associate with that man. Stay here with us here in the crowd. See, Jesus is very good at making himself unacceptable. If you read anywhere in the Gospels, he, he doesn't follow to the whims of the crowd and their wants and their desires. Oftentimes, he, he gathers this group of people, not because he asked them to be there. And he finds a way of saying something that upsets them, and, and most of them walk away. Jesus is very good about making himself unacceptable, yet he offers himself fully to those who are willing to accept him. To those who are willing to accept his message, to those who are willing to receive, he fully offers himself. Though his message to many people is oftentimes unacceptable. Zacchaeus, the day he met God and, and what followed after. See, Jesus um, apparently didn't learn what my mother taught me. Is that, uh, although I don't know if I ever actually learned it, um, she used to tell me this. It's not polite to invite yourself over to someone else's home. And uh, I had after service all the time growing up, my friends, there were people I wanted to hang out with. There were things I wanted to do. And I would invite myself over to, to people's home. Can I come over to your house today? And my mom would tell me, Taylor, that's not polite. You can't do that. You don't invite yourself to people's house. They invite you. See, I don't know if Jesus knew this, um, but it's very interesting. <laughs> See, Jesus doesn't invite us to his home. He invites us. He invites himself into ours. Jesus doesn't invite us into his home. He invites himself into ours. Why? Because he wants to be with you. He wants to rearrange your furniture. He wants to eat the food out of your refrigerator. Jesus doesn't invite us to his home. He invites himself into yours. And notice Zacchaeus' response he quickly, in great excitement, he runs to Jesus, the very person he was moments ago hiding from. In great excitement, he runs and he invites Jesus into his home. In Luke 19, 7 through 8, it says, But the people were displeased, for he has gone to the guest of a notorious sinner. They grumbled. Meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and said, I will give half of my wealth to the poor, Lord, and if I have cheated people on their taxes, I will give them back four times as much. There's a great quote from C.S. Lewis, and he says this, and if you remember the story from last week and the story from this week, I think the more we preach in this series, you're going to begin to see this theme. But C.S. Lewis says this, he says, the real test of being in the presence of God is that you either forget about yourself altogether or you see yourself as a small, dirty object. So you'll have a hard time finding Jesus. You'll have a hard time seeing Jesus if you can't first admit that you are tragically lost 
without him. It's those who are lost that can find their way to being found, but if we never admit our own depravity, if we never admit our own nakedness, and the funny thing is we're hiding from the very thing Jesus already knows about us. We're hiding from the reality that Jesus has made you, Jesus sees you where you are, and his message to you is to come out. Come out, come down from the tree, come out from your place of hiding. Why? Because I want to be with you. I must be a guest in your home. Guess where we're going, Zacchaeus? Right into your living room. I don't want to meet with you out here in this square. I want to meet with you in the most intimate way. I want to come in and I want to fellowship with you. See, the verse says, meanwhile, Zacchaeus, he stood before the Lord. See, the crowd is outside. But Zacchaeus, he found himself standing before the presence of the Lord. Kenneth E. Bailey, if you're wondering how I got so smart in this message and know all this ancient information about trees and the, the ancient world and where they plant them and what they do with them, it came from this book. Uh, Kenneth E. Bailey, he has a book called Jesus Through Middle Eastern Eyes. If you were with us at Christmas time, this is the book Lindsay was sharing a lot of information about the manger scene in the stable. It's a great book, gives us some cultural analysis of understanding things sometimes we miss in scripture. But he says this, One of the most important aspects of this story is that it presents a rare view of a person who has received costly love from Jesus, and it records his response. What does the prodigal do the morning after the banquet? We don't know. Is the older son willing to join the banquet? We are not told. What radical changes can be expected in the lifestyle of the wounded man aided by the Good Samaritan? The text does not say. But here, the reader is given a rare glimpse of the world of a recipient of costly love, and his response is profoundly instructive. See, one moment with Jesus changed the life of this man. No longer is he a a thief and a robber, but he's a philanthropist, right? Right? What a change. I mean, what else but God? What else but God would have brought such a transformation? And and as you think about your life, the day that you met God, what else but God would bring such a transformation? You think of who this man was three sentences earlier, and one moment with Jesus and Zacchaeus stands up and says, whatever I've cheated anybody, I will give back four times as much. See, there's no interaction of Jesus telling him, well, now that you've met me, uh, here's the things you got to do. Uh, I need you to sell your house. And, you know, we do have some of those stories in scripture, but there's no instruction from Jesus here. What we have is a moment of a man who has been changed in the presence of Jesus. You continue in the story, Luke 19, 9 through 10. Jesus responded, salvation has come to this home today, for this man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and to save those who are lost. I mentioned this last week at the, the end of the, the message, but salvation, someone say salvation. Salvation is a name. Salvation is a name, and his name is Jesus. We, we oftentimes think that, that salvation is this, this external gift of God that we receive. But, but salvation is a man. Salvation is a person. His name is Jesus. If you don't believe me, look it up. When the angel comes to Mary, his name shall be Jesus. His name shall be Emmanuel, for he saves his people. He's come to rescue. Salvation is the literal definition of his name. And it it changes this response when we look in Luke 19, 9 through 10, that salvation has come to this home today. Jesus didn't bring a present with Zacchaeus to open up and say, here, I brought something for you. No, salvation, Jesus himself has come into this life, has come into this home today. 
See, but the problem is many of us, we want to see Jesus, but we don't want to be seen by Jesus. But Jesus tells us his purpose. He says, I came to seek and to save those who are lost. He, he came to seek you. I don't know if you've ever been a kid playing hide and seek, and, and you've been hiding out behind the bush. The whole point of the game is that the person seeking would go out and he would find those who are hiding. Jesus came to, to seek. Why did Zacchaeus, uh, was, why was he found in the tree in his place of hiding? Because Jesus knew he was there the whole time. Jesus was seeking him the entire time. And, and Zacchaeus, although he thinks he's hiding, although he thinks Jesus cannot see him, though he can see Jesus, Jesus says, I've seen you exactly where you are. He says, get out of the tree and come to me. I must be a guest in your home. Salvation has come to your home today. Why? Because you were willing to receive what other people thought was unacceptable. You were not offended by my message, but because you knew of your own nakedness, because you knew how lost you were without me, you were willing to receive. And Zacchaeus receives Jesus into his home. And if I could tell you anything today is this, is Jesus sees you. There's no place we can hide, no tree big enough, no sin deep enough that Jesus doesn't already know about. Jesus sees you and Jesus sees me and he calls us out of our place of hiding. And uh, man, as we respond today, this is one of those stories in the Bible you don't really have to preach too much because it sort of preaches itself. But, you know, I think there's many of us in this room today that, that you know, as we talk about the day we met God and, and what followed after, there's many of us that, that we've already found him. There's many of us we've already experienced him. There's many of us that are currently walking with him. And, and this is what I want to ask you today. Do you remember the day that you met God? Some of you, that might have been 20, 30 years ago. You know, this kids camp, I'm so excited coming up because we're sending a group of kids out of their homes, out of their environment, disconnected from technology to get in a place where they can see Jesus, to get in a spot where they can see Jesus. And scripture tells us that those who look to see Jesus, those who seek him out will find him. But Jesus has been seeking you from the beginning. And if you can remember the day, this is, this is what I, I want us to remember. It's another quote from this book I encourage you to read. It's so easy to forget what it feels like to need Jesus. But we all need him. We need him every corner in every circumstance of our lives. Some of us, we've found Jesus, but do you remember what it was like to find him for the first time? Do you remember how desperately lost you were? And, and do you know that you're one decision away from being just as lost again? The dangerous thing for us as followers of Jesus is that we would forget our need for Jesus, that we would find ourselves outside the door among the crowd looking at the people that, that Jesus shouldn't dare associate with. And we would forget that our identity is with those people. You have to be lost in order to be found. You have to recognize your need for Jesus in order to receive Jesus. And, and sometimes after we've received, we get comfortable and we think, man, like I already know this feeling, but we forget the feeling of what it means to be lost. And eventually, if we're not careful, we'll end up as the 99, selfish and jealous, frustrated why Jesus would go after the one. And instead of celebrating the one that Jesus' whole purpose was to seek and to find so that he would be one of us. We forget the home, the, the heavenly kingdom that we've been invited into all because of our need for him. The day Zacchaeus met God and what followed after. Zacchaeus, he wanted to see Jesus, and God was calling him out from his place of hiding. But what about you? Are, are you a person here today that wants to see Jesus? Do you truly want to see Jesus, not just to know about him, but to 
see him again. Jesus enters into the home. This isn't supposed to be this one-time experience. Although, let me tell you that in one experience, he can change you forever. But Jesus, he wants to enter in. He wants to live with you. He didn't invite us to his home. He invited himself into yours. Jeremiah 29, 13 says, You will seek me and you will find me when you seek me with all of your heart. Revelation 3.20, talk about the, the storybook of the Bible. These themes are connected all throughout. Jesus says, look, I stand at the door and I knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and we will share a meal together as friends. Jesus is, is knocking at the door. I, I think it's funny it's the last thing I'll share this morning, just because I, I think it's a shift in culture. I don't know if you guys have one of those ring doorbells. Um, if you don't, they're a great feature to add to your home. Uh, I'm not a sponsorship, but if ring wants to give us some money from this sermon, that'd be great. Um, <laughs> ring doorbells. So it's a, a video camera as a doorbell, and you can see the people that come to your porch. You know, it's interesting that the further back in time you go, the more normal it was for someone to come to your front door. On the Ring doorbell, you can watch these videos of uh, people. It's a neighborhood watch program, so people can submit their videos, and if they see something sketchy going on, they can report it, and you know, has anybody seen this person? And I'm amazed how many times people are freaked out. There's like a man in a, a yellow vest that clearly says Comcast, and he's knocking at the front door, and people will submit it. Who is this stranger coming to my door? Have you seen this person in the neighborhood? He just came up to my door. How dare he come up to my door, right? It's like the, the greatest offense in our culture is that someone would come to your door. But did you know Jesus has come to your door? And the problem is that I think too many of us are reporting Jesus. We're like, who's this man standing at my door? He's not welcome. He's not welcome. I, this is my safe place of my home. You don't dare come to my door. It, it's interesting, though, that Jesus, he, he didn't say, hey, Zacchaeus, we're having a barbecue later. Come on over. No, he says, I got to be a guest in your home. Bring me to the place where you live. And, and Revelation says, look, he's, he's standing at the door. Those that hear my voice and open the door. Some of us have turned it, it went off. We've turned it off. See, the interesting thing about this story, Zacchaeus, he meets Jesus. But if you notice from the beginning, Zacchaeus already wanted to see Jesus in the first place. Zacchaeus knew who he was, and he wanted to see Jesus. And today, are you a person sitting here today, watching today, your desire is to see Jesus? Because I'll tell you this, those that seek him, with all of their heart, those that want to know him will find him because it's a promise that he's declared and God is no man that he would lie. He is true and those who seek him wholeheartedly will find him and he's at the door and if you would open it, he would come in and he would share a meal with you today. So I want to invite us to pray this morning. Man, maybe you're here today and you know that experience firsthand to open the door and to let Jesus in. Man, I want you to reflect, not just this week, but throughout this series, I want you to think and to remember of the day that you encountered Jesus for the very first time. I want you to reflect the changes that took place in your life. I want you to reflect the last seven days, what changes have taken place in your life. And if you're a person that fellowships with Jesus, you can guarantee that the food's going to be eaten from the fridge. The furniture's going to be rearranged. Things change when we get into the presence of Jesus. If something hasn't changed in your life for a while, man, I want you to pray that prayer today. Jesus, I want to see you. Jesus, I want to seek you today. I want to know you today. But maybe you're here and, and this is the very first time you would pray this prayer. And I'm not going to um, ask for a show of hands this morning because I, I think this is a moment that Jesus wants to meet with you. And, and I think each of us need to determine in our own hearts today this question, do we want to see Jesus? 
And so I'm going to invite you to pray. And if this is your prayer, I simply want you to say this, Jesus, today I want to see you. Jesus, today I want to know you. Jesus, I know my sin, my past sin, my present sin. Jesus, I know I'll continue to sin, but I'm done with hiding. I want to come down from the tree. I want to open the door to my heart. Today, I want to see you, and I want you to see me. So Jesus, I invite you in to my heart today. Change me, and may I continue to follow you. Jesus, today we thank you for this story of Zacchaeus, which is just as much relevant to us today as the experience and the moment that Jesus, Zacchaeus, met you for the first time. God, today I pray that we would be a people that we don't speak from knowledge, but we speak from experience, the experience of knowing you firsthand because you are a God who wants to live and to dwell with us. And so Jesus, as we leave this place today, would you dwell with each of us? And God, we invite you to change us. We invite you to rearrange our life in a way that lives to honor and to please you because we know the gift that it is to be seen by you, to be welcomed by you, and to be forgiven of a great debt. So Jesus, we thank you for the work on our behalf. God, that that is finished yet is continuing in with each of us. God, we would continue to be a people that fellowship with you, that walk with you, that journey with you. Jesus, change us today from the inside of our homes and out. Be with us. God, pray blessing over the people of Path Church today. And uh, God, bless our time of fellowship after the service today as we fellowship and share this meal together. In your name we pray. Amen.